Good morning and welcome to Online Worship. I'm Leslie Anderson. I am your Director of Connections and I want to welcome you again on this Sunday morning. In just a few moments, Pastor Jason's going to give us another Bible story that you need to know. If you have questions about Crossroads Global Methodist Church, email me at any time. But now let's prepare our hearts for the message. Online Church starts right now. Hey everybody, so good to be with you today. If you are tuning in for the first time ever, special welcome to you. My name is Jason Mulliver. I'm the directing pastor here. So glad that you have joined us today. Today we are going to be looking at Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. If you want to turn there in your Bible and hear this reading from God's Word, Luke 14, beginning at verse 15. When one of those who reclined at table with Jesus heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Jesus said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, I just pray that now you will just fill our hearts with your spirit's wisdom and knowledge and enlightenment. Let us hear what you want us to hear today through your word and through the opportunities you're presenting to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we get started today, I want to take a couple of minutes to share again our discipleship pathway here at Crossroads. We haven't had this diagram up on the screen for about a year, and we're kicking off our fall ministry season, so I thought it would be a good time to just go through it again. If you have come to Crossroads or been watching Crossroads for a few weeks, you've probably heard our mission statement. Our mission is to glorify Jesus Christ by reaching and growing and helping. We want to reach as many people as we can with the message of salvation through Jesus. We want to grow more and more like him ourselves. We want to help those in need whenever and however we can. So the grow aspect of our mission statement has to do with something called discipleship. That's the process of growing together with other believers around God's word to be Become more like Jesus. And discipleship is not something that happens in a day. Discipleship is a process. So what our staff and discipleship team try to do is to offer a pathway for people to follow in their journey of living and growing as a disciple of Jesus. And so this diagram illustrates the path that we have laid out. So I just want to walk through this and maybe you'll hear the Holy Spirit pinging you on what next steps he's calling you to take. So at Crossroads, we believe the first step in discipleship, maybe even before you surrender your life to Jesus, the first step is worship. Christians have been expressing their commitment to Jesus as Lord through meeting on the first day of the week in the morning to remember and celebrate Jesus. They've been doing this since Easter, the first day that Jesus rose from the dead. Every week they would gather again on the first day of the week. So worship is this ancient Christian habit, and it's really the keystone habit for a life of following Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus all the way through to the finish line of your faith, the finish line of your life, the most critical thing is to be in the habit of worshiping Jesus each 
and every week. Over the years, you'll be a part of different maybe service opportunities or growth opportunities, but the weekly worship habit is critical. It's where we come together each week in numbers to re-surrender our hearts to Christ and worship Him as God. It's where we come to be filled with the Holy Spirit as we lift our hearts in song to God our Father. He pours His Spirit out and fills up our tanks. It's where we come to hear about all the other opportunities that God is presenting us for growth and service. It's also where we come to hear a unique Word from God prepared for our congregation. Jesus speaks to us through his word when we come together. You can see from worship, the arrow goes to grow groups. And grow groups is just the way that we refer to our small group system here at Crossroads. And grow groups meet at church or at people's homes at various times throughout the week. We have dozens of grow groups at Crossroads. And the primary purpose of these groups outside of worship is fellowship and study. And the Christian to the core groups that we're going to be launching into um, beginning on September 8th, these are essentially short-term grow groups that will take this 12-week study together. Many groups are forming just to go through Christian to the core together. Some of those will stay together as grow groups after Christian to the core, and some grow groups will study that material. But you'll have an opportunity uh, if you just go to our website and you click on discipleship to be a part of that opportunity or to become a part of a grow group, get more information. And we hope you will. Above those, you'll see a bubble that says Alpha. Now, Alpha is an amazing time-tested course that for giving people an overview or refresher of the Christian faith and for answering a lot of questions that people have about Christianity. So if you feel the need to hit refresh, maybe go over the basics again, you will definitely be blessed by participating in the Alpha course, which is starting in just a few weeks. This fall here at Crossroads Alpha will be meeting on Tuesday evenings. It will include a meal and a lot of great discussion. Not only only is the material good, but we have some amazing leaders that run our Alpha program. Uh, Leslie Anderson, our Director of Connections, and her husband, Bob Anderson, they lead that together with Ray Lee, and it's a great course, great food, great fun, and I have personally gotten so much out of Alpha. I've led it several times, and that material has really sunk into my life, and I encourage everyone to go through that at least once. Now, to the right of the Grow Group bubble, you'll see doing what Jesus did. And this is a class, a training course, that my wife, Janice, and I, and Holly Snyder lead along with a number of amazing table leaders. We started offering this class four years ago so that we could train people in spirit-filled ministry. This class trains people in how to share their testimony with others, how to lead people to Christ, how to hear from God on other people's behalf through his word and through the Holy Spirit, how to pray for others for healing, and how to do spiritual warfare. This is to equip people to do what Jesus did, to do that kind of ministry. And as a congregation that's always striving to be more spirit-filled and spirit-led, we hope that everyone will eventually get an opportunity to take this training course. This year, our Doing What Jesus Did course will be meeting on Wednesday evenings, starting on October 1st. If you haven't taken that, we hope you'll consider joining us. Under that bubble, you'll just see the word uh, in-depth short-term studies. And these are just kind of studies that pop up uh, for a season that cover a topic or a book of the Bible. And they're really great. And we had a number of really good ones this summer. And so those are just kind of sporadic that come up and people often love those. Now under that bubble, you'll see something called discipleship bands. And these are small groups of three to five people of the same sex who meet weekly or bi-weekly for accountability and prayer. These are self-forming groups where you grab somebody and say, hey, you want to start a discipleship band? We always offer materials for this at our welcome desk. If you'd like to know how to start one, there's also a discipleship band app that you can easily find 
on your own search engine. And I've been a part of one of these accountability groups for almost the entire 26 years that I've been following Jesus as an adult. So be praying and thinking how God is calling you to jump in this fall. We're so excited about these opportunities, a great menu of options. But now let's look at our text from Luke 14 for a bit. Last week, we started looking at this chapter, and we saw how one Sabbath day after synagogue, Jesus had been invited to the home of a prominent Pharisee for lunch. And the Pharisees, they hated Jesus, and they were trying to catch him doing something that they considered illegal. So they arranged for a very ill man, a man with edema, to be present at this luncheon. And they wanted to catch Jesus healing him on the Sabbath, something that they believed was unlawful, but that Jesus believed was in line with God's law. They wanted ammo against him, so they put the bait there. What did Jesus do? He took the man and healed him and sent him on his way and then gave a short lecture about how that's the compassionate thing to do. Then Jesus told a parable to the guests because he saw how they were all jockeying for the best seats at the table of this luncheon. And he told them they needed to not do that. They needed to humble themselves and let others exalt them rather than exalt themselves and be humiliated by others. And he was pointing to how God calls us to humble ourselves instead of trying to exalt ourselves. And if we humble ourselves, God will lift us up in due time. And then Jesus turned to the host. He said, the next time you throw a party, Invite the outcasts who can't repay you, and then you'll be repaid by God in the age to come at the resurrection of the righteous. So he's kind of called everybody out at this luncheon, uh, probably pretty tense and awkward at this point. And then we get to verse 15. It says, When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to Jesus, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And this comment seems a little bit out of left field. Jesus has literally been putting the scribes and Pharisees in their place. And someone just says, ah, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. It kind of feels like somebody trying to break tension by saying, how about those cubbies? Or how about those cards? And that might be close to what's going on here. Because Jesus had appealed to the host in verse 14, saying that if he changed his behavior, that he would be rewarded on the day when God's kingdom arrives in its fullness, on the day of the dawn of the resurrection age. Jesus had appealed to that doctrine of the coming resurrection and that coming age, a doctrine that both he and the Pharisees held in common. So this guy, breaking the tension, says, won't it be wonderful when we finally arrive at that eternal kingdom, that resurrection age. But two important things about that kingdom need to be recognized for the sake of this conversation. One is that both Jesus and the Pharisees agreed that not everyone would be there. On the day of resurrection, those who were not righteous would be raised from the dead, but then they'd be sent to hell. Only the righteous who were raised would go to this eternal kingdom in the resurrection age. A second thing to note is that the Pharisees definitely believed that they would be there because in their minds, they were the most righteous of all. So then Jesus tells another parable to emphasize that the Pharisees need to rethink their confidence about their place in the eternal kingdom of God. And we can break this parable down into four sections. The invitation, the excuses, the inclusion, and the exclusion. First, we see the invitation. Jesus starts in verse 16 by saying, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. So in ancient times, in Jewish life, an event like this would have been a huge deal. There was very little to break up the tedium of life in a primarily agricultural setting. There was very little water. It was dry and kind of oppressive. The the Romans were oppressing everybody. It wasn't pleasant. People had to work hard to get by, have enough food, have enough money each day. Now, the man depicted here would have been a man of great wealth because he was throwing a great banquet and many were invited. A party like this would have been the highlight of the year in a Jewish community, maybe the highlight of a decade. This is a huge banquet. People would be thrilled to be invited to such an event. Verse 17, at the time of the banquet, 
he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. So the way these events were communicated is that there would be an invitation sent out, kind of like an engagement announcement today, saying that a wedding was coming, watch the mail. So the first invitation will let people know the general time and place of the event, but people would have to RSVP to let the hosts know if they would be attending. And then there would be a lot of more burials before the exact event would be ready. There would be uh, the correct number of livestock would have to be gathered and butchered. All the fresh fish would have to be caught and become available. The vegetation and grain would need to be harvested and prepared. So the first invitation was a heads up to gather the guest list for the event, telling everyone, be ready, we're gonna do this. Then when the, everything was actually ready, a messenger would go around and tell everyone, now's the time. Come to the party, all the food, all the festivities are ready. And so people would be waiting expectantly for this moment. This was the party of the century, and no one would want to miss this. The wealthy man, he sends out his servant to tell the guests, come on over, let's party. And here's where things get a little janky. We arrive at the excuses section of the parable. Verse 18, but they all alike begin to make excuses. Really? All of them? The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Now somebody bought a field sight unseen and they're saying they have to go see it at this exact moment. This is already getting lame. Like the dirt in the field is gonna change overnight if they don't skip the banquet and go see it right now. Now something I found funny as I was reading different Bible commentaries is that scholars say this is preposterous, that someone would buy a field without seeing it first. I chuckled because the way the housing market is right now, many people are buying homes sight unseen because when something comes available, you gotta grab it quick. It won't be on the market long. But this guy already owned the field. There's no urgency here. This is a lame excuse for missing the banquet. Verse 19, another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Again, this is ridiculous. The guy had just bought 10 oxen, sight unseen, absolutely has to go examine them right now. The time to examine them would have been before he bought them. There is no urgency at this moment. By the way, both of these guys would have been considerably wealthy to be able to buy a field and to buy 10 oxen. So this is just bizarre. And this would be very rude behavior to the host. Verse 20, another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Now this might be the only excuse that we could sort of understand. Tensions at home. It's like the guy's saying, you know, I was planning to come, but I did not clear it with the boss. And so, you know, I have a wife and she's putting her sandal down and saying, I blew it, we're not going. Now in reality, this would be the most insulting of all the excuses. No young couple would miss the opportunity to go to a banquet of this magnitude. And the guy's throwing his wife under the bus. He had already said he would come. He doesn't ask to be excused, just says, we're not coming. Total snub, total snub. Verse 21, so the servant came and reported these things to his master. So what's going on here? What's this parable about? Actually, this parable is not hard to decipher. There is unanimous agreement that this is referring to the Jewish rejection of Jesus. The people who had become Israel, they already accepted God's first invitation that he had sent out. God called Abraham to follow him, promising that he would make Abraham into a great nation. And Abraham did, and he did make Abraham into a great nation. Then God sent Moses to get that nation out of Egypt and to give them the law. And they did receive Moses, they did receive the law. Then God sent the prophets to call them back to him when they strayed. And through the prophets, he communicated the coming of the Messiah. And they had said, amen, we wait for the Messiah. Those things would constitute the first invitation that God sent to the Jews, inviting them into eternal relationship with him into his eternal kingdom. They had RSVP'd, they were coming. They couldn't wait. But then the second invitation, that everything was ready, that came with the arrival of the Messiah. 
First, John the Baptist went out telling all of Israel, the time has come, the Messiah is about to be revealed. Repent and get ready to experience the kingdom of God. And then John said, hey, this is him, it's Jesus. I baptized him, the Holy Spirit came down and anointed him. The kingdom of God has arrived. But when that second invitation came, the Jews rejected it. They snubbed the Messiah. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees that they who were so confident that they would be seated in the eternal kingdom of God were in fact in the very process of rejecting it at this very moment. So then we get to the inclusion section. Verse 21 again. Then the master of the house became angry and said to the servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. So notice the master's response. He was angry. He was insulted. This communicates unequivocally about how God feels about those who reject his offer of his son. Preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones said this shows that the greatest insult to God is to refuse his offer in Christ. It says in John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but must endure God's wrath. Snubbing the Son of God is the greatest insult that anyone could give to God the Father. So then the master tells the servant, go out into the city streets and bring in the riffraff. And this is alluding to how Jesus, who was rejected by the leaders of the Jews, was warmly welcomed by the ones that they considered irreligious. The tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes. Those who couldn't keep the Pharisees' rules, but were no less loved by God. Go to those people on the margins of Jewish society who aren't righteous. Tell them to come in. And of course, the Pharisees hated that Jesus spent time with the people that they had rejected. But then he broadens the circle in even further. Verse 22, the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. So here he says, go outside the city walls. Go out to the highway people. Go out to those who don't even have houses, who live in brothels, inns, along the roads, in the bushes, in the caves. He says, compel them to come in. This is a strong word that means they need to be dragged in. These people were so far outside the realm of social acceptability, they wouldn't even believe that they were invited to a party such like this. They would be hesitant to come because they knew they could never reciprocate. And commentators agree that this third group, this biggest circle is referring to us, Gentiles, people who don't follow the law of Moses, who weren't Jewish first. Jesus didn't just come to save the Jews, even though he was the Jewish Messiah. He came to save everybody, even though he was first offered to the Jews. He came for you and me, those outside the city, those outside the Old Testament covenant community, people like us. It says in Romans 1 16, Apostle Paul says, I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. The Jew first, but also the Gentile. Yes, Jesus was sent first to proclaim the good news to the Jews. They rejected him, and the doors were open for all of us. And that was God's plan all along. Finally, we see the exclusion in verse 24. Jesus concludes by saying, For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. And this is referring specifically to the Jews who rejected Christ, and more broadly to all who reject God's offer in Christ. People who reject God's invitation in Christ will by their own decision exclude themselves from the eternal kingdom of God. And it won't be because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit weren't trying to compel them to come in. God has sent his spirit to work on every person's heart. God sent his son to die for the sins of every person. God has sent missionaries and preachers and uh, people through social media. God's been appealing to people in dreams and visions in Muslim and Hindu countries. He's been speaking to people in near-death experiences, trying to get people to come in. God has done everything but veto people's free will 
in order to get them to come in to his eternal kingdom. T.W. Mansfield summarized it well, saying, the two essential points in Jesus' teaching are that no man can enter the kingdom without an invitation from God, and that no man can remain outside it, but by his own deliberate choice. So let me give some closing applications. Number one, the kingdom of God is the most wonderful thing. Jesus refers to the kingdom of God as a great banquet. And he's saying it's a party. It's the best thing that God has prepared for all who will come. This is the imagery that's found in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. This was the imagery that the Jewish people of the time held to. It's a great festival. It's a great feast with music, dancing, laughing, food, drink. And that's how we need to think about the eternal kingdom of God and the life devoted to God here and in the coming age. It's not drudgery. It's not a funeral. It's the best possible life. Jesus came so that we could have life and have it to the full. This is why people who start coming to church and getting active, they find new joy, new meaning in their lives. They make new friends who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it gets contagious. Then they surrender themselves to Christ and they get the Holy Spirit. And they start making healthier decisions based on healthier perspectives and healthier priorities. They experience the satisfaction maybe for the first time in their life of using their gifts to serve God and others in eternally significant ways. That's why these fall discipleship opportunities that we're offering, they're invitations to community, to growth, to joy, to discovery and fun. The community of God both now and in the age to come is wonderful and abundant and good. Number two, we must accept Jesus to enter the eternal kingdom. This is key to understanding this story. There is no other way to enter the eternal kingdom except through Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And just like the Pharisees, there are multitudes of people today who think they're going to heaven, but they're not. Because there's only one way in and they have rejected it. We have to respond to the invitation of Christ. It says in John 1, 11 and 12, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. People, we have to believe in him and receive him to become eternal children of God. And this invitation is for everyone in the world and it's also for each of us. Have you fully surrendered your heart and life to Jesus? Have you fully accepted God's invitation to eternal life and abundant life? Jesus died on the cross and paid for your sins. If you turn from your sin and accept him wholeheartedly, you will be forgiven of your sins and adopted into God's eternal family and given the Holy Spirit. Have you been making excuses which sound very reasonable to you? It's time to lay those excuses down and come to the party. Finally, we see we must compel other people to come to this party. We who have already accepted God's invitation, we're now the servants, out calling everyone, winsomely inviting and encouraging everyone into this life with God. So this fall, I wanna encourage you to keep inviting people as you go to sporting events, musical events, go out with your friends, carry invitation cards inviting people to church. When God opens a door, invite someone to join you. Send this online worship video to someone. If you're in a grow group or a Christian decor group, invite someone to join you. If you're taking Alpha, invite someone to join you. Get a Crossroads t-shirt, wear it in the community. When people ask about it, invite them to church. There is so much room in God's kingdom and we are his servants trying to compel everyone in this lost and hurting world to come home to God through his son, Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, help us all to fully embrace everything about who you are. Let us live wholeheartedly to you and let us invite so many others to join us God, no one comes to the Father but through Jesus. And it's our job to receive and then to invite. So compel us to do that in Jesus' name. As we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us declare together what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.